Yeah, we thought we had um, successfully gotten rid of him, but he's back now. Jason. Yeah. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, discussion as part of the Encounters uh, Film Festival here in 2020. Uh, we're doing it all virtually. So let's hope that um, the tech survives this conversation, and we all do as well. It's really wonderful uh, for me to, to welcome the directors of the two films that uh, you've just seen. My name is Judith February, and I'll the discussion between Anthony Fabian, Anthony is the director of the film Good Hope, and Safisa Kanyile, who is the director of the film A New Country. We will, uh, the conversation will be bouncing between the three of us, well, between the two directors, and I'll try to moderate it. But there'll also be an opportunity on Facebook Live for you to put your questions uh, to, to both Anthony and Safisa. So please keep those coming as well on this rather chilly Cape Town night. So welcome, Anthony and Safiso. Uh, firstly, to say that what two beautifully made films about our very, very complex uh, and bewildering and bewitching country. And I think particularly this weekend, we're all feeling um, a little bit at sea because we're following the politics of the day. What the two of you provided in this film is a step back, but also a look forward in, in a sense. But um, I want to put the question to both of you, and perhaps starting um, with Anthony, A for Anthony, um, around the process of filmmaking and what brought you both to the subject and um, how did you decide which lens, figurative lens, uh, to look uh, to th through for both of these films? It struck me that um, yours was, uh, you know, there's a future-looking aspect to it, but um, that there's... It seems to me, as as the first time viewer, um, some, somewhat slightly more positive, um, and Safiso uh, trying to to deal with some also more of the demons in a sense. Um, but just the process of filmmaking and, and the lenses that you, that you chose to to um, to make these films. So Anthony, to you first, and Safiso, feel free to come in then. You're on mute, Anthony. There we go. Uh, thank you very much, Judith. Um, essentially, my journey with South Africa, my relationship with South Africa began with the story of Sandra Lang, uh, who was a, a colored girl born to white parents in the Eastern Transvaal in the 50s. Um, and I heard this story in the UK on the radio and was really blown away by it and by how much it had to say about race and um, how different the fate was of this girl to the rest of her family. And I was very shocked and astonished by that. And um, <clears throat> decided that I really wanted to tell that story. It became a feature film, Skin. And in the process of um, researching that story, because you need to, to really get to grips with the history of the country in order to tell that story, I made a documentary called Township Opera which was about singers from the townships mostly uh, and across the country who were performing at the Spear Music Festival in Stellenbosch. And so that was in 2000 and it was not that long after the end of apartheid. So it was a very interesting time to be here and to tell that story. Um, I then, as I say, made Skin, which was released in 2008, 2009. And when I, you know, by then I was really a, a fan of South Africa and uh, <laughs> a part of the country. Um, and by then I started to come back in the last five, six years, um, develop new friendships, new perspectives. And what struck me was how negative the narrative was about South Africa always from the outside. So whenever you heard anything about it in the UK, um, it was always doom and gloom, and it's all going to go horribly wrong. But when I was in South Africa, I had a feeling of hope and possibility and construction and change and development. Uh, that schism between how it was being, uh, you know, how it was being sold to the world and what it felt like to be here was really the kind of starting point for me. I wanted to explore what the negativity was about and and whether there was perhaps perhaps another perspective or a glass half full on the country and to focus not just on the problems 
but also the solutions, which, you know, I found very much amongst the younger generation of South Africans. Um, but what's very interesting about watching Sviso's film is that it also shows, you know, how frustrating and, and um, you know, the, the really deep, deep rooted structural problems that, you know, although I, I certainly deal with them, you know, are, are very much, uh, you know, more pervasive and perhaps, you know, uh, more of the cause of that negativity and that pessimism. Uh, just by my nature, I, I, I want to focus on solutions, not just problems. So I think that's why my film ended up being the way that it was. Thank you. Sophie, so um, to you, I mean, the, um, in, in Anthony, in your film, there's somebody says um, it's the most pessimistic, we're the most pessimistic country in the world. It's interesting as an outsider coming in, and that struck me about the film, that you're had that uh, was less uh, pessimistic than I think those of us who kind of live in South Africa and of course you interviewed South Africans but um, it was interesting that lens. So for you, so to you because you, um, yeah, they, I mean you're, it has a, a different lens but I'll, I'll hand over to you. Hi, thanks. Thanks Judith. So um, my film was made uh, as a response to a call that was put out by the NFVF um, to make films about the 25 years of democracy. Um, and I think in 25, in, in 2019, sorry, there, there was kind of like a lot being said about South Africa, you know, a lot of it uh, positive, but um, there's also just a lot that took place uh, that really went, went that great. When we were filming, uh, we filmed our first time last year, um, sort of like late August, um, early September. And I remember that it was just, you know, um, Uinene had, had just been killed in Cape Town. And, and so at the beginning, I think in terms of like the, the lens with which I wanted to tell the story, was to try and make a balanced film, because I really believe that documentaries in the realm of storytelling, and if you're telling a story, um, there, you know, you, 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 it can't just be all negative, it just can't be all tragedy. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there was in, 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 in doing the interviews and speaking to the different contributors that you see in the film, there emerged this like urgency to try and correct things as they are, you know, and really try and question the integrity of our democracy to be, you know, to be try and be frank and as honest as we can about where we are 25 years later. Um, and so the kind of lens shift, shifted for me because it was, um, at the beginning, it was just like, oh, you know, we're going to have like uh, these really celebratory tones right at the beginning about, you know, the, <clears throat> about 1994 and the years that followed that, um, you know, and our constitution. And then it kind of changed because I think there's a real frustration and it's not just with the contributors in the film. I myself am frustrated with how things are, are, are happening and I think I'm against. And I really wanted to address that. I um, wanted to have like a no holds barred conversation that really spoke to where we are as a country. But um, so to both of you, I think what you very skillfully do is you you take us back and you give us a lens forward, but you quite skillfully avoid is perhaps the wrong word, but um, don't focus too much on the narrative of the very present, the kind of very present politics that we're sitting with, issues of corruption um, and so on. Um, you know, it, you, you manage to do that very skillfully. Um, is that a choice or is that how things turn out, Anthony? I certainly was aware that it was a danger with this film, which took four years to make. Um, but with, uh, with stuff, by the way, so, um, is that um, I didn't want the film to date very quickly. I knew that that was going to be a danger. If it became too much around current affairs and not around bigger themes and ideas and, and um, you know, things that essentially, what was so interesting was that there were things, people I interviewed four years ago, and their interviews were as valid today as they were four years ago. So that that helped me make topics more universal and and bigger bigger in their in their scope i had the very weird um review uh, when the film was launched from somebody in cape times or something who said oh well how quaint this film is because it doesn't talk about covid and now everything's going to be different 
And I thought you've completely missed the point, you know, because in fact, COVID is just an event like everything else is an event. And we'll we'll get through COVID and we'll get to the other side of COVID. And the issues of, of Sufiso's film and mine will still be there after to come. So, uh, you know, I think it's <laughs> yeah. a very deliberate choice not to not to pin it to current events too much. But for me, the election of Cyril was definitely a pivot because uh, Zuma had been such a negative force for so long. And Cyril, you know, whether you want to call it Ramaphoria or whatever you want to call it, um, does still, for me, offer the possibility of, of change. Um, and maybe not quick enough, and maybe it's frustrating, and maybe he's part of the rotten core and everything else. But mm. compared to Zuma, uh, there's just no comparison for me in mm. terms of world respect. He's at least a leader that can be respected. Mm. Sophie, sir? Um, so I think my film sort of, um, it, it kind of, I think it, there's a there's an inherent assumption of of, of where we are, right? Mm. Um, in in the opening, it does say two decades after democracy, this is where we find mm. ourselves, and then continues to sort of like retrospectively look at events um, or policies uh, that got us here. Um, so I think in terms of like that position, my film is clear. I mean, it doesn't sort of explicitly say that we are in two thousand and you know, uh, sorry, 2020, yeah. 2020 or 2019. Um, but it, 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 it's the, I think that for me, the more important, the more important conversation was about how we got here. And, and so, you know, the unpack me more important to be like, you know, how do these events connect? You know, how do we review the TRC now? You know, and everything that we've seen. Um, so not focus, focusing so much on um, say the events of the last two years or maybe three years about corruption and everything, but speaking more about like the culture of impunity in this country, you know, and that we've never really had accountability, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and that was a deliberate choice on my part because um, one, it didn't have enough time to pack all that in, 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 in a TV hour. But secondly, um, you know, like these events keep repeating themselves in some way or another, you know, we still don't have accountability for most of the apartheid debts, you know? Um, and, you know, the years that follow that with like um, uh, president, uh, presidency. And so for me, it was like the, the, the importance sort of diminished in trying to focus on like specific events, specific individuals, but really again, just about like the value, the nature, the integrity of our democracy and whether what we've constructed as a national identity or, or, or the idea of rainbow nationalism is still valid today. Can I ask you a question, Savisa, if I may, Judith, uh, jump in? Uh, sure, Anthony, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, it occurred to me as you were speaking that, that there's, there is a major accountability to be explored and to be dug out of the Zuma years as well. And, you know, uh, that's, you know, that's a more recent uh, uh, atrocity, in my opinion, in mm. terms Is there any chance that that can happen? Yes. Sorry, what's the question? That he could be held in, the, You know, there's a, there's accountability about about colonialism, about apartheid, but there's also accountability about the Zuma years, which which I think you know the amount of corruption and and pillaging of the state that has that has um, disbenefited the majority of the population. Um, has, is severe. So what are the chances, the mechanisms that might help restore so, some of that and make those years, uh, you know, make him accountable, make make that period accountable as well? For sure. So, I mean, I think when you spoke earlier on about like, um, you know, about just the timing of, of, of uh, the release of the documentary and, you know, not wanting to put a timestamp on it, um, for me, just to try and answer your question directly, is that yes, but I feel that there's a lot of conversations that are happening around that right now uh, that are inconclusive. You know, um, we have the Zondo Commission, for example, um, they're still ongoing. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of filmmakers have also focused on that subject. 
Um, current affairs is, is focusing on that subject. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, both print and, and I guess broadcast media that are focusing on this. And so for me then it's, um, again, um, it became less important to focus on specific events, even though we do touch up on, on, on specific events. And, you know, it wasn't, ex uh, uh, I think, explored in its full scope because it was just like, we don't know where this is going to go. You know, we, we know the impact of um, how it's affected South Africans, but do we know whether or not we'll see accountability? I don't know. Um, and I think a large part of that for me was leaving it up to the contributors in the film. Um, Can I, yeah, so if you say that, it's great, because that actually leads me into the next question. I mean, I've got around the issues of accountability, which run. So I love the poem by Anki Kroch, The Country of Grief and Grace. And at the end, she says, but if the old is not guilty, does not confess, then of course, the new can also not be guilty, nor be held accountable if it repeats the old. Things may then continue as before, but in a different shade. Uh, and that, to me, sort of encapsulates some of what um, you know both we're doing in the docu in your films, and particularly you, Sophie. So, is this need for us to have a rendering and a reckoning? And so, then my question is a comment on on that Einke Kroch um, stanza. But then also, if we look around the world. Um, there is a global moment of reckoning. And is this South Africa's moment of reckoning? I mean, in Sapisa and your film, lots, there's lots about um, protest. I mean, so what the contributors says, um, we are ready to protest on the streets. I, you know, if, well, some of that's happening. And then, um, Anthony, in your film, there's a lot about innovation. We're going to grab this opportunity to, to you know, take this country to an exceptional level. Um, and so it, there's a tension um, between your two films, in a sense, with regard to that in my mind. But it strikes me as this global reckoning. But how do we do that in South Africa? Um, we've had the TRC. Anthony, some thoughts from you, and then I want to bring in Safiso on that. Well, I, I think, um, so my film has a lot of protest as well. Mm. <laughs> um, and one of yeah, the purposes yeah. of the film is that one of the things that makes South Africa great and uh, gives me hope is the fact that people do take it in their own hands to, to change what's wrong. And they do get mm. on the streets and they do protest. And there's a muscle memory of protest, you know, which dates back from apartheid, possibly further back, mm. um, which, is, which, which, which has been re-engaged, whether it's in the fees must fall or roads must fall or, um, you know, and, and, and which certainly was very engaged in the Zuma must fall movement. You know, so protest is a big part of my film as well, uh, mm. saying this is part of why I think the country has has hope because people people do take it in their own hands to 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 protest. Um, you know, once once Zuma was gone, I haven't seen as much of that recently. Um, you know, um, maybe. Uh, maybe maybe there is something which is bubbling, which you can see in Sufisa's film, that anger. Uh, one of your contributors, whose name I can't remember, but she's amazing, um, you know, wearing the beret and, and the suit. Oh, the yeah. Suit. Uh, Dr. Yeah. yeah, she's amazing. And so she's, you know, she's basically suggesting that, you know, the anger is, 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 is mm. going to erupt into more, you know, more protests, more uh, fighting, if you like. And we haven't mm. seen the we have we haven't seen the the last of this in any way, so mm. I I would say that it's not you know but on the other hand I as I said earlier I am a big believer in not just saying this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong but to say this is how we fix it and these are the solutions and these are the people who are going to be taking the country forward and making things better. And I think for a lot of people, they were not aware that there were so many incredibly articulate, brilliant and positive and optimistic people in South Africa who do want to make, be part of the change. Because we see a lot of the people who can point out what's wrong, but not always mm. the people who can say how it might be made better. Hmm. Sophie, you want to respond to that? And then we've got a question from uh, the audience, but I've got some others as well. Yeah. 
Um, so I just want to quote uh, Marcelo Modana, um, artist and political in the film. And when she speaks about um, uh, the Fees Must Fall movement, she says something very, very um, interesting. She says that, you know, the, um, you know, processing for a free and decolonial uh, education. And then she extends that by saying, um, I don't know if you can get a decolonial education in a, in a colonial society. So I thought, you know, this would be like the moment, right, for, for South Africa's reckoning. But I also find that we, there's a lot of like moments of outrage. Um, but for some reason, we don't really have like really sustained, um, um, you know, uh, protests and outrage like this. Somehow we're negotiated out of our protests and things get back to normal. And yeah. so once again, um, I'd just like to say that, you know, that's why it was important for me to make a film that speaks to the structural makeup of our society. Um, to say that, you know, um, it becomes irrelevant uh, whether or not uh, there are people who are invested in the status quo and who try and, 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 and do a lot of good. But, you know, that good might just be cosmetic because if we're not changing our society structurally, then what are we doing? Because Dr. Bev does say in the film that we'll get to a point in, in our society where it's just protest after protest, and then what? What are we going to do? So mm -hmm. I'm concerned about that, about whether or not um, these efforts, you know, geared towards um, changing the status quo are actually working? Or do we need to kind of like rethink our society entirely, you know, from, you know, policy, you know, economic policies to how we, we relate to each other, the idea of reconciliation. So for me, that is of paramount importance and not necessarily just about like, you know, individual or, you know, organized efforts towards just, you know, making it a bit more harmonious. But Safisa, what is it? Because I think it's um, Mary Metcalf um, who it says, um, she says, you, you need for that, you need, if we're going to change the country structurally, you need um, a consensus and you need leadership. And it seems as if that's where we uh, are falling short because consensus in South Africa looks like what? Um, and also leadership. Um, so maybe, yeah, you can both comment on that. Um, it struck me as quite a tall order for this kind of very, um, you know, society where we often, although, I mean, it was interesting, one of the comments that was also made about sometimes our rage is unproductive, but at least we're having the conversations. And that I feel on, on many days um, that, you know, it's better said, even if it's unproductive sometimes, and who's the judge of that. But anyway, just maybe Sophie said thought from you about the leadership and consensus issue, a comment that Mary Metcalf made. Sure. Um, I, I I worry about that because um, mm. of the structure of our democracy, right? Um, you know, we've kind of have like the different political parties that we've placed to, to lead us. And, um, you know, from where I sit, I don't see real solutions coming from um, from any of the parties that you know stand mm. to to govern us, and so maybe I'm coming from a, a cynical place, but um, I, I I I think you know South Africa we keep like it's so divided, and those divisions mm. keep getting stronger and stronger. We saw with you know like you know the votes that the Freedom Front Plus got in the last elections, and so. And so for me, it's, it, it, it's, it's really a question. How, how do we begin now um, to, to, to like build a strong leadership with um, the leaders and the potential leaders that we have? Um, I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. Hmm. Anthony, um, yeah. do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Good. I mean, I, my perspective is that right now in the world, we're, we're in a very dangerous time where the vested interests of big corporations are actually leading politics by the nose. So, you know, in, in the United Kingdom, Brexit would never have happened if it hadn't been in the interests of the very tiny 1% that are going to benefit from this, while the rest of the country is going to spiral into a pathetic little, little Britain. And the United States is the same, where you have Donald Trump who has appealed to big business and oil and the corporations 
And so you can have a complete moron at the head of the state because he's appealing to the people with the most money. And to some extent, that is also a problem in South Africa that, as you say, the structural changes haven't necessarily happened because the vested interests of big business are to some extent driving the politics and, and have the power to drive the politics. But on the other hand, given that I'm also an optimist, I, I see there's also a pendulum that swings, you know, when it goes too far in one direction. I, I personally don't think Donald Trump is going to be reelected. I'm not alone in thinking no. that. Um, and I also think that Cyril is a kind of interim president. He's the president. He's part of the old guard. He's a little bit of the new guard. There will be a younger voice, a younger leader in South Africa who, um, who, who, who has more of Sufiso's uh, perspective, more of, more of his point of view, more of his understanding, and who may actually balk at the power of big business to lead where the country should be going. And I know that Musi Maimane is a very controversial figure, just as, um, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Malema is also a controversial figure. These are two young leaders who have very different approaches and very different perspectives and ways of being. But what, what Musi has done is that he he's left the DA, he started this social movement, the One South Africa. Mm -hmm. And what he says about it is that um, he wants to go to the, to the whole country, you know, have a kind of grassroots movement that tries to address what it is that people on the ground really need. So it's almost like a communist approach in a way, strangely, although he's always accused of, of, of appealing to, to business. Um, approach is one where he's looking at the grassroots and he's looking at the people and he's saying, what is it that you really need to be delivered? And he's developing these networks across the whole country to say, what is it that, that's missing for you? Um, and perhaps at, you know, at the point where his research is done, there may be a new party that emerges, which, is, which breaks down the existing political structures, um, which aren't working, and perhaps is more people-based. You know, so maybe that, whether it's him or somebody else, maybe that is a way forward in a way. Hmm. Well, Safisa, you're you're Safisa, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to, today, there was a launch of a new political party by Herman Rashava, of course. Yeah. For sure. I I have a question for Tony actually, um, and this um, was was a, a, like a small observation on on your film, Tony. Um, please correct me if it's a bit misguided, but I kind of felt that the way in which you um, sort of handled or treated the EFF um, uh, and the Blackfest, uh, Landfest uh, movement was a little reductionist in a way. Um, and the, the, the ones afforded nuance, um, almost kind of like one dimensional and the dimension almost sort of kind of like bordering on, 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 on like barbaric. Like when we see them, they're shouting, they're fighting, um, they're threatening uh, death, whereas the other spaces were kind of treated with a bit more nuance. And I wondered whether or not, um, you know, in, in your position, you feel that then the solutions for the people, as you say now, um, are embedded in a more sort of like progressive or more liberal um, politics in South Africa. Thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I tried relentlessly for four years to get the EFF to talk to me for this film, and they just couldn't be bothered. There was no response from them whatsoever. So there was nobody from within the EFF who was willing to put their point of view forward. Um, and, and I tried from every angle and I've got great connections. So it wasn't like um, I, just, I just, I didn't get to the right people. They just didn't want to, they didn't want to know, they couldn't be bothered. So that was one, one problem in putting, but that, that also informed how I felt about them. Because I thought, you know, if you can't be bothered to take part in this even handed attempt at telling the story of your country, then what is it that you're hiding? You know, what is it that you're not wanting to participate in? Um, and I suppose there was also an element of feeling that um, a lot of their politics are unbelievably divisive from my perspective. They're not, they're not liberal, they're not inclusive, um, you know, openly divisive. 
Um, and I'm sure there is a lot more nuance, and I know that there are some very good people within the EFF. And in particular, so Sizwe uh, Mpofu Walsh, um, he's, he is essentially a, an EFF guy. We in the film, and he was the closest I could come, if you like, to that more moderate voice of the EFF. But I do think that the solution, I don't think personally, my own instinct, and I could be completely wrong, but as an outsider, I don't feel that they're really representative of the spirit of your country, which I think is more inclusive, you know, without it necessarily being, um, you know, because I want to protect certain interests. I think, I think that this vision of a country where everybody has opportunity is for me closer to the true spirit of the country. And everyone should be lifted up and everyone should be given opportunity. And so I prefer an approach that is more inclusive than the one that I feel from the from what I've seen and what I've read. It's a fascinating insight. Um, Sabiso, do you want to respond to that? No, it's a, okay. We can okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a question um, in the uh, Facebook chat and um, uh, from Solafelo Kwakwa, and she says, thank you for your thought-provoking and engaging films. And for um, she says, with the ongoing issues in South Africa surrounding inequality and freedom, how can we as citizens use the issues discussed in the film to move forward as a country? I mean, from both of your films, that was the push, is that, um, you know, no government is going to fix this alone. We have to be doing something. Citizens need to be active. Um, and so, yeah, Sophie, so perhaps you want to respond to Solofello? Um, can I go after Tony? Sorry, this is my mind. Sure, Tony. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, How do we fix it? There yeah. is, you know, there isn't a single solution, is there? But mm -hmm. I think you've, just, you've, you've actually touched on what it is that I think South Africa does really, really, which is that when the government lets people down, they make a plan. And, you know, whether they, they then go to civil society or they go to NGOs, or they go to finding their own solutions within their own communities, um, or telling their own stories. Because, you know, part of my motivation for making that I hope would spawn um, local filmmakers, more local filmmakers, to tell their own good hope stories and to show this other side of the, you know, to show the solutions as well as the problems. So I think the solutions are out there. They're in the hands of the individual. And they are, it's primarily about getting the message across that government can only do so much and is only going to solve so much. Mm. Um, you know, if they're not delivering, if they're not providing good education, um, if there's corruption, these things need to be tackled by citizens individually and, and mm. made. Yeah, and Sophie said, well, in Anthony's film at the beginning, I think it's Justice Malala who says it always felt as if we were going to implode. But in a sense, South Africans live between, I mean, the pendulum, that hope and kind of, you know, despair. Um, but somebody asked in that, at the beginning, what are you going to build? You know, what is it that we're wanting to build? And I think in your film, forgive me if I'm confused, is that, you know, what, is, what does it look like? What does the future look like um, where somebody asks where a woman is safe to, to walk in the street at night? You know, what, what does that future look like for all of us? Um, so just to touch up on the, on the last question from Facebook very quickly, it's a very yeah. short answer. I think that, you know, South Africa has a really um, like strong heritage of, of protest. Um, we're, we're well versed in, in, in protest, and I think that's a tool that's readily available for us in trying to change things from, from where we sit. And I don't see any other way, to be honest, of like holding our leaders accountable, of really trying to transform our, our society, uh, rather than just, you know, I guess, you know, hitting them where it hurts the most, which is the economy. Um, so I'll, that's, that's it for me in terms of the last question. Um, with your question, Judith, I think um, from that quote, especially, um, Nabagazi Manzi, who speaks right at the end of the film, um, talks about listening. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we're at a point where there's just so much outrage and, you know, we're all kind of like shouting at each other that's, you know, from like, um, you know, like different positions and there's so, mu so much polarity. And I guess for me, it's the undoing, the unthreading of this rainbow nationalist idea 
of like who exactly of asking like the basic questions of who who we are as a nation. Um, what does it actually mean to be South African? Who has the legitimacy? to be a South African. There were very interesting conversations around this when uh, John Stiazen um, uh, in some interviews was saying that, you know, South Africans are tired of the lockdown, open the economy, and people were asking, but, you know, <laughs> when you say South Africans, who are you talking about? And so that made it very clear for me, you know, it was a clear indication of um, that we are as a society, that even in our national identity, it is not clear who can lay claim to South African. So that's, that's a very me and I think that that is the beginning of where we need to start um, uh, fixing to just be to just say that you know um, how much um, are we really invested in continuing and building on top of this national identity that we have now or how much do we want to um, undo it and start afresh um, and I think there's a lot of potential um, in, 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 in both tra tra trajectories um, to build a new identity for South Africa that isn't mm. violence, because South Africa is founded mm. on violence. Can Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. Tony, go, go yeah. for it. Can I just add to that? I mean, part of it was in your film, I think, where somebody said, the greeting, Sawabona, I see you. And yes. to me, that just goes so well with the listening. Uh, yeah, that, exactly. that was this film, yeah. Exactly. So, so just to add to what Siviso just said, one of the lessons for me of making this film, and which I hope people will respond to, is that we need to have much greater understanding across all, across all, all cultures. So rather than sitting in our own bubbles, um, you know, one of the things that I hope the film does is cross many different bubbles. And, you know, I, I could be accused of of having only very articulate and, you know, um, well-adjusted people and not enough uh, speaking to, like, I love the guy on the street who was, you know, a part of the um, uh, recycling uh, team. I loved him. I thought he was great. But it was very hard for me to find people who could express the ideas that I wanted to express who, who were not articulate and, and so on. And I think also I wanted to show that there is a different a kind of South African that then most people generally see. I speak the but same criticism. This idea, way. again? I suffered the same criticism. By really? The way. Interesting, interesting. So the, the politics of representation, um, I thought yours was better in a way than mine in that sense, was, was perhaps more representative. But it annoys me when we when we are told what kind of people we need to include in our film. Because, you know, I think if you want to make a film about the man on the street, go and make that film. You know, I wanted to make a film about the people that most people don't ever get to hear, the really super articulate people who are out there, you know, working on these questions, these big questions and solutions. Um, and I think the more we can we can make these, these, these bridges across cultures and across these bubbles, the more successful South Africa this question, you know, what is legitimately, you know, what gives you the, 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 the legitimacy to be South African? You know, I think people who have been born in the country, in most instances, you know, that's enough um, to, give, to get a passport, for example, um, you know, wherever they came from. So, you know, if you're Greek or if you're Malian or, you know, or, or Zimbabwean or wherever you came from, you're born in South Africa, theoretically, that should give you the legitimacy to be South African. You know, if your if your family has been there for generations, I think that should give you a legitimacy to be vegan. But I also think that you know there should be more teaching of of other languages, of African languages, in in all schools, in wide schools. You know, I I wish I spoke Zulu or Kosa. You know, because I think that would give me greater understanding of many of the people in the country. So. It's for me, it's very much about building bridges across countries, being seen and listening to each other that is part of the big solution. Mm. And uh, there is that opportunity. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I just, there was a fascinating, um, the, the comment by um, Tembeka and Mui Tobi, where he talks, about, he says, we must never abandon the myth of South African exceptionalism. And that's quite a, I mean, that to me, because quite often with the Rainbow Nation people, you know, there goes South Africans again thinking they're special and actually they're very ordinary. And it was quite interesting, Safisa, I mean, you can comment on this, that 
because it allows us to dream of something bigger and better is possible. And um, I thought that was a marvelous way of kind of taking something which has become rather tired and injecting a kind of new life into it um, and, and a, a hopeful life, despite um, what he talked about, dispossessing people of land, of cattle, wage laborers, you know, the three ways in which um, African black people were dispossessed. Um, it, it was just, a, a, it just resonated. Sophie, so do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I remember when, when they came about and I think mm -hmm. I was in, um, <clears throat> in a position that's really um, of the belief that, you know, that identity is is tight and sort of like drummed up a lot um, in mm. trying to fix, you know, uh, South Africa's problems. Um, but it's something that I really thought about. And I thought, and I think people speak about this in the film and about, mm -hmm. you know, what was at stake during the negotiations and about like the bloodshed um, that we see at the time and how it was necessary um, to believe in this idea of a unified South Africa. Because um, in my research across, and it's, it's so weird, sorry, I'm just going off a little bit here, working as an archive researcher and curating that and just like how, how much of the um, you allow yourself or you allow people to see in the work that you're doing and the stuff that you come across. There's some really, really traumatic uh, images that come from my period, you know. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, you know, a lot of the film kind of like speaks to negotiate not really what was happening on the ground. So what was happening in Togoza, what was happening in Adal Spray, what was, you know, we see a little bit of Bisho as well there, but, you know, not really in detail. And so um, there needs to be an understanding of what was at stake, of what is probably still at stake today, um, if, we, if we don't try and, and, and work towards um, a unified South Africa and, 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 and magic. Um, it's just so unfortunate that the more we buy into this idea, of um, South African exceptionalism, the more it others, other people other, from other parts of the continent. And I think that it can inadvertently give rise to ideas of xenophobia and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and I guess what people refer to as Afrophobia. So yes, um, it's something that I, I, I subscribe to, but I think we kind of have to be, you know, sort of like tread lightly because it is, it is kind of like dangerous to read. Mm. Anthony, did you want to come in on that? Um, well, no, I think I, I think. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I thought you wanted to. And then no, no. this last, I mean, we've got five minutes to wrap, but they also the waste picker at the end of your film, Savi. So he says, maybe we weren't ready for democracy. I mean, I found that incredibly poignant, you know, as if, you know, you know when, when is one ready for this? Um, and it just struck me as, you know, how bridging the gap between all the individuals in the film um, is, is sort of a life's work in a sense. And, and Athel Williams says that, one, you know, he says we're in the middle of, mul there were multiple transitions here. And so, um, yeah, and I mean, Anthony, your, your film deals with that too, you know, the, the multiple transitions in a sense. Yeah. I, I would like to add, though, uh, with regard to the exceptionalism, that I think South Africa is a really exceptional country it is a unique country and it has unique opportunities because of all the different cultures because of its history and it has the possibility to teach the world a lot about how to make things better i keep shouting about this with everything that i do but it's very hard to get anyone outside south africa to listen um, to how how much south africa can teach the rest of the world because the narrative that the rest of the world is getting is so focused on the negative. It's so focused mm -hmm. on the, the things that are wrong. And so I think part of the answer is also about showing, you know, what can what, what can be taught from the country that is positive. And finally, I also think that for me, the, the hope that I have comes from not only Sufisa's generation, but the one that's coming up behind him, because their experiences hopefully will be you know, that much improved, you know, further and further away from, from what's wrong within the society, if, if it can be fixed stage by stage. It takes a long time. Mm. Sophie, sir, uh, last word to you. Yeah, in closing, and touching up on the, the question that you put forward, and I think this is something that um, a few speakers in my film uh, talk about, and more succinctly by um, Dr. Bevdizi again, who says, you know, when she says that we never went through any sort of healing. Um, so when you talk about like, you know, 
um, the different transformations and the different transition. One thing that is left is that there's still no sort of like um, idea of some sort of restoration, um, you know, um, reparation in some way. Someone mentions reparation. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, for me, um, yes, we'll kind of, we'll see these different transformations, but there's the one thing that that's, that, that's left is that we are not, um, you know, trying to heal a society in any way. Um, we live in a really violent society, guys, and this is a reality. And I think that we really need to come um, to, you know, to a reckoning with that, to be like, you know, where, where, does, where does this violence come from? You know, um, we, we see it every day. We see it with police brutality, with like gender-based violence and femicide. Um, and until we get to a point where we start to heal or we gear efforts towards healing, um, South Africans, I feel that, you know, um, there's not a lot um, um, that we, I guess, we, 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 can, we can do to really transform our society. Sifisa, that's a great subject for your next film. <laughs> right. There you where go. Sifisa, that, South that, African that, violence, you know, where is it coming from and how can it be, mm -hmm. how can it be turned around? How can it be changed? That's a, I would love to 